If I were to summarize the first chapter into two sentences, there would be, we establish a framework to visualize matrices, went through the famous ones, visually they were pretty cool. The second sentence, there are two special matrices we need to remember, the diagonal and the orthogonal matrix. They are special because the transformation on vector they produce have a simple visual interpretation. Diagonal matrix scale or stretch each axis, whereas the orthogonal matrix produces a rotation. But in the harsh war of matrix, most transformations do not have an easy visual interpretation and can hardly be described by words. The symmetric matrix is one example. The goal of this video is by the end. You can look at any symmetric matrix and trivially say, well, its transformation may be visually complicated, but using spectral decomposition, it will just be a sequence of three simple transformations, and I know exactly what they are. And just like any enlightenment of knowledge, a journey is required. To truly understand the theorem, we need to unlock some tasks of understanding first. The first task, what is the symmetric matrix? As you guess, some form of symmetry exists within. More specifically, symmetric around the diagonal line. The numbers on each side are equal. When the matrix is not square, aka rectangular matrix, uh, is unfortunately never symmetrical. The term transpose by itself does not refer to a matrix, but rather transpose is an action you perform on a matrix, which is to take the rows of a matrix and make them the columns instead. Oftentimes, we call the resulting matrix A transpose or transpose of A. You can likewise transpose a rectangular matrix, but notice the dimension of the left matrix change. It went from 3x2 to 2x3 now. The action of transposing a matrix may seem random, but it relates closely to our protagonist today. If you try to transpose a symmetric matrix, you get exactly the same matrix back, which is why an alternative definition of symmetric matrix is S equals to S transpose. But what's not so obvious is that when you transpose an orthogonal matrix, you actually get its inverse. And this is a very interesting property that orthogonal matrix have. Remember, orthogonal matrix produces a rotation. The inverse of matrix means untransformation. The untransformation of rotation means rotation in the reverse direction. The transpose of orthogonal matrix is also the inverse. The transpose of orthogonal matrix is rotation in the reverse direction. For example, if I tell you orthogonal matrix Q rotates around the z-axis by 25 degrees, you can simply transpose that matrix, which would rotate around the z-axis by minus 25 degrees. What is matrix decomposition? But let's ensure we understand matrix composition first. Whenever we multiply matrices, we're essentially composing their distinct transformations together into one transformation. For example, I can multiply the three matrices on the right to get the one matrix on the left. And visually, it looks like this. Matrix decomposition is essentially going the reverse direction. Suppose you have the transformation of one matrix. Decomposing means you re-express that as a sequence of much simpler transformation. Composition of matrices is simple. We just follow the rules of matrix algebra and multiply them together. On the contrary, decomposition is difficult. If someone just throws me a random matrix and asks, decompose this into three simpler matrices, I have no idea where to even start. Would the first matrix be a scaling, a shearing, or a rotation? I don't know. But hopefully, spectral decomposition can be the beacon of light. If you have never heard of eigenvector or eigenvalues, 
then the de facto place to learn them belongs to the essence of linear algebra by what truly is a legendary channel. Some words down in the comment section really represents my heart. Today, forgive me to present a personal and subjective interpretation on this concept. You see, after visualizing so many different matrices, their transformation really feel like distortions. Vectors are moving to different places, scaled by different factors, askew to different directions. If we just pick a random matrix and follow the movements of a few vector, we see that the linear transformation knocks out the vector away from their original direction. And it seems like every vector always gets skewed away from their original line, no matter which vector we pick. Every vector? Or is it? Actually, for this particular matrix, there are two vectors hiding within. They are able to stay on their original direction in the midst of linear transformation. Those are the eigenvectors. While every other vector deviates from their initial direction, the eigenvectors stay on their original line, despite the distortion from the matrix. If one vector is an eigenvector, all the vectors along its linear span are also the eigenvectors. This is a property of matrix being a linear transformation. But we just pick one eigenvector, normally of unit length, to represent the set of all the eigenvector along its line. Also, note the eigenvector is relatively defined in respect to a matrix. Different matrix can have different eigenvectors. The eigenvectors for matrix A is probably not the eigenvectors for matrix B. And it's entirely possible for a 2 by 2 matrix to have less than two eigenvectors. Once we have the eigenvectors computed, normally by some software, we often denote them with vector symbol E1, E2. And then we can ask what is the eigenvalue for each vector. You should think eigenvalue and eigenvector always come in pairs. The eigenvalue, which is a number, tells how much its corresponding eigenvector is scale during the matrix transformation. For example, the dark blue eigenvector has an eigenvalue of 2.7. During the transformation, it got stretched longer by a factor of 2.7. If we watch the animation again, and this time pay attention to the light blue eigenvector, it got scaled shorter, because eigenvalue is only 0.6. After seeing the visualization of eigenvector in action, its formal definition becomes much more straightforward, which is saying, the eigenvectors are such that, when receiving a linear transformation from a matrix, they stay on their original line, only scale by a factor of its corresponding eigenvalue. A very strong property which symmetric matrices have is that its eigenvector are orthogonal. And when we describe vectors as being orthogonal, we mean they're perpendicular. Although this statement doesn't seem that strong with an initial glance, but let's take a moment to appreciate just how probabilistically unlikely that a matrix eigenvector are actually orthogonal. Firstly, we know that for n by n matrix, it's entirely possible it does not even have n eigenvectors. 2 by 2 matrix can have less than 2 eigenvectors. Even when it does have a full set of eigenvectors, what's the chance that the two vectors just happen to be perpendicular, exactly 90 degrees to each other? Pretty unlikely, right? But when the matrix is symmetric, we can guarantee to have its eigenvectors being perpendicular. Then you might ask, oh yeah, I know, the vectors are in 90 degrees now, what about it? Well, what else is perpendicular? The standard bases, the x and the y axis. This means there always exists an orthogonal matrix, which rotates the bases to align with the eigenvectors, and the inverse of that matrix, which would rotate the eigenvector to align with the basis. If the eigenvectors are not perpendicular in the first place, such a rotation transformation would have been impossible. Now, we have officially unlocked all tasks of understanding and ready to see spectral decomposition. The theorem is saying, whenever you have a symmetric matrix, you can always unconditionally decompose it into a sequence of three simple matrices Q transpose, lambda, Q. But Q is an orthogonal matrix, lambda is a diagonal matrix, Q transpose is also an orthogonal matrix. 
By this time, when you hear the term orthogonal diagonal as a decomposition of a more complicated transformation, this should really be a reaction. Precisely, the column vector of matrix Q are the normalized eigenvectors of S. The matrix lambda is diagonal, and the numbers of the diagonal are the eigenvalues of the eigenvectors arranged from left to right. We simply transpose matrix Q to get Q transpose. And this decomposition can generalize for any n by n symmetric matrices. Now we know exactly what matrix Q, lambda, Q transpose are, down to their numerical value. That means we can also be precise about describing their transformation visually. Let's start with the easy one and assume S is 2 by 2. Matrix lambda is diagonal. It means we stretch the x-axis by lambda 1 and the y-axis by lambda 2. How about matrix Q then? It's orthogonal matrix, so we know it's some form of rotation. But what rotation precisely? I sort of gave it away earlier back. It rotates our standard basis to align with the eigenvectors. Consider vector 1, 0, which represents the x-axis, multiplying that with the matrix Q, we get the first eigenvector. And likewise for vector 0, 1, represents the y-axis, multiplication with Q, we get the second eigenvector. More generally speaking for higher dimension, matrix Q apply a rotation transformation such that the i-th standard basis moves towards the i-th eigenvector. On the other hand, Q transpose, since it's the same as Q inverse due to a strong property of orthogonal matrix, it would just be a rotation in the reverse direction, such that the i-th eigenvector move towards the i-th standard basis. Now let's visualize in action. This symmetric matrix can be spectrally decomposed into the three matrices on the right. The linear transformation S produces looks like this. But we know it will just be a sequence of three simple transformations on the right. Firstly, we identify the eigenvectors of S and rotate them onto the standard basis. Secondly, we scale the x-axis by 6 and y-axis by 2. Thirdly, we rotate backwards from the standard basis to the eigenvectors. Likewise, we can also apply a spectral decomposition on a 3 by 3 symmetric matrix. Let's look at what happens to the tiny color cube under S. We also know this transformation is exactly the same as the 3 sequential transformation on the right. Firstly, we identify the three perpendicular eigenvectors of matrix S and rotate them onto the standard basis. Secondly, we scale the x-axis by 4.15, y-axis by minus 1.56. Since it's a negative scaling factor, vectors are going the reverse direction by the magnitude. And then a tiny bit stretching in the z-axis by 1.31, in reality, matrix lambda does three scalings simultaneously. I'm just breaking them apart so it's easier to see. And thirdly, a rotation backwards from the standard basis to the eigenvectors. And the transformations we just witness is exactly the same as S. And now we can also look at the effects of decomposition on image. Oftentimes, the topic of spectral decomposition is taught in school as a list of procedures to follow by the students, which quickly turns into tedious finger exercise and boring algebra, while the underlying elegant geometric interpretation is dismissed. What the theorem gives us is another chance to express a more complicated transformation, just as a sequence of simple rotation scaling rotation back. In particular, the rotation is guided by the eigenvector, and the scaling are told by the eigenvalues. And I think the connection here is quite profoundly beautiful. And this is a visualization of spectral decomposition. The problem is, just how often do you get a symmetric matrix? 
If you just go into matrix land and grab a matrix in random, firstly, it's probably not square. If it's square, it's probably not symmetric. In reality, the theorem is pretty with a loss of generality. But would it be possible we can take the similar spirit of decomposition and generalize for all matrices? Doesn't need to be symmetric or square, but any arbitrary matrix of any dimension. And this leads us to chapter 3, the grand finale of linear algebra, singular value decomposition. See you there.